Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So I-V-D-I. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. How do you prevent a fracture of the mandible during and after the procedure when you have a radiograph where the tooth is compromised or the bones compromised significantly around that tooth root? And Allison Marie asked that question. And so when you've got that situation, where you've got a really significant decrease in bone, which would happen if you had a tooth that was partially erupted that had a cyst in it. And if you're watching on YouTube or you're watching live here in the workshop, that is the radiograph that I've just described where you've got significant bone destruction and there's very little bone left there. If you are doing this, and you've got a, a lot of experience doing extractions of mandibular canine teeth that have that type of involvement where the cyst has been associated with significant bone involvement, the canine tooth involved with it, then it shouldn't be an issue because you know how to do that without compromising the mandible. If you don't know how to do that, if you've not had experience with a lot of surgical extractions, know the anatomy, have the experience, then that significant bone loss is not something uh, that you want to do. But from that statement, that question, Allison, may be how do we prevent it? We're really careful when we put our torque pressure on that tooth root to remove it where we can't remove additional bone where it's not feasible to remove initial bone because we may be compromising bone too far apically and we don't want to do that in some instances. But we're just really careful. If we don't put a lot of torque on those, we make sure that we're slow and deliberate with our technique. And same approach to root tips, slow, deliberate, sustained ex- extraction force with a luxator elevator allows us to have really good control over that and really good control over not fracturing uh, that mandible. So great question. And when we're dealing with something like that, where you've got significant bone, you may or may not be dealing with extraction of a normal tooth, normal canine tooth in association with a cyst, but a canine tooth associated with a cyst that's not erupted all the way, then that tooth root is really far back in the mandible, then that presents a situation that involves more bone just from the socket of the tooth, but it's still the same as a real significant cyst that extends back to the second, third premolar or so, which happens when the patient gets older if these are left undetected. Again, back to that first premolar in the mandible that's missing that you detect radiographically on especially brachycephalic breeds. And I don't want to specifically limit it to brachycephalic breeds because it happens with breeds of any breed or mixed breeds, but specifically them because they're at, at really high predisposition to that. So recovering following something like that is not a major problem. It's it's just like extracting those teeth and 
having a proper flap surgically that closes the area. These are, in Brix's phallic dogs, more prone to dehiscence. Why? Because you have a huge tissue mass adjacent to the extraction site that's more, in, in these cases, again, if there's, a, if there's a huge bone defect that has to be filled, and in our case, we use a jugular sample to fill that defect, uh, a, a jugular uh, blood sample. You can use a bone graft and blood, uh, but we just use a blood sample uh, just as effective. And, but if you close that long incision that's, that allows you to get into and get all that cyst material out and extract the teeth that you need to extract, then that's a bigger flap, and you're doing it in a brachycephalic dog. And guess what? Especially in boxers, you got that huge boat paddle of a tissue mass or tongue that's laying up against that extraction site and it's moving back and forth over that extraction site and it's heavy and it's placing downward pressure on it so that makes it more likely to dehiss and i have had a couple of those over the years in boxers that have dehissed and if we have dehiscence generally it doesn't pay to redo those we let them heal by second intention which is not an ideal it takes longer. It may be uncomfortable for them for longer. And it does require antibiotics for a short period of time, usually a week. And then that fills with granulation tissue. And it's actually un imperceptible versus what it looked like, what it would look like if the sutures were there. It's just not ideal, obviously, with primary intention healing if that suture pattern stays and there's no disruption by dehiscence. The recovery for that, if it doesn't dehiss, which is a very rare occurrence, a very uncommon occurrence, is like it would be for a mandibular canine extraction. There's really no difference. Elizabethan collar, analgesics for three to five days. We use NSAIDs. We might use a, a pain patch, depending on the extent, fentanyl patch. And so whatever your analgesics of choice are, stay modal would be the way to go with that. Great question. Let's go to, let's go to the next question here. Are there any other situations other than dentiguous cysts where you would put a juggler sample into a defect or a create a clot for improved healing? Amelia Jane asked that question. Amelia Jane, that is dependent upon the volume and also where it is. So if you have, if you do an extraction in the mandible, especially mandibular canine tooth, there may not be enough blood in that thick cortical bone when you're ready to close, to be able to close. Sometimes you want to go back and you want to scrape that cortical bone, see if you can get a bone clot that's going to come up to the level of the marginal bone that's left. If that's not the case, then indeed, and Answering your question, you would you could use a juggler sample and just fill that alveolus with blood and then suture over the top of it. Really nice question there. Morgan, most common breed, Morgan Deschel. Most common breed for densi dentiguous cysts is Brakes Phallic dogs in general. Boston Terriers, pugs are super bad. Um, boxers are bad, uh, but any brachycephalic dog is for grabs when it comes to missing first premolar in the mandible. Carol Kluka, how painful are dentiguous cysts? Would a small cyst be painful on palpation uh, such that it might be detected on physical exam? Generally, no. Uh, they're not painful. They become painful when they break through the bone and they get into uh, the tissue and formal fistula, then you have bacteria coming in, inflammation coming in to the defect, to the cyst, causing inflammation and infection, then it's painful. So these go undetected many times, and it would be nice if they were painful and the patient showed signs when they first started, but that's just not the case. It doesn't happen that way. Nice question, Carol. 
And Melinda has a question. I've touched on this a little bit. Are these cyst repairs really suitable for general practitioners if they're beyond a, a volume that's manageable with a simple flap exposure and they don't involve the canine teeth? The answer is yes, you can do that. It's like extracting an uninterrupted tooth. If you're comfortable extracting an uninterrupted tooth, especially the, that same tooth, that uh, first premolar in the mandible, which is generally the case if it's early, and there's minimal bone involvement, even if the canine tooth has a shadow of involvement that's not too big, and too big would be maybe the same diameter, maybe a little more than the tooth itself that's uninterrupted then many of you would be comfortable doing that. Otherwise, it'd be best to refer if you're, not, if you're not comfortable with that. Thank you, Melinda, for that question. And Jennifer Voles, is there a reason for why the premolars were not removed in this case, even though they have lucencies at the roots? And for those of you, let's look at that on the screen. For those of you who are listening on the podcast, and then there are some increased periodontal ligament spaces around these tooth roots, which we now have to determine they're left, obviously, after the extraction. We have to determine if we are extracting those or not. And I can't recall on this particular case specifically, but those, those I can't recall in general what the determination was, but I know this patient had increase lucency around all of the teeth that are more involved than what we would normally see because it's a bigger or it's a younger patient. It's not a super old patient as evidenced by the lucency around the tooth itself. So if comparatively, which in this case, it was comparatively similar to other teeth, then we don't extract and my guess is that this is probably, I don't know this is a case which is what I was getting to. I got off on another thought, but I don't know if this is the case where we just took a post-op radiograph of the extraction to make sure that was okay before we went on uh, to proceed because we do have a fractured incisor that I know we extracted that shows up in that image and we haven't done the other side yet. So you can see that in the image as well. Very likely that we did we left those because the other ones were similar and there's no reason to extract those. And visibly, we look at that too. If we do assist removal, sometimes we can see the tooth root. If the apex is not involved, then that tooth root stays because it will form cementum in all likelihood. It'll form bone around that tooth root and it will fill in normally and you won't be able to tell. There'll be a periodontal ligament space and it'll look normal after that bone fills in where you put that bone graft or that boot clot. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.